our university is a mini representation of the country, so that is the reason why uh, we have taken initiative. Uh, it's in the center, it's organizing lecture in the University of Hyderabad on Saturday is uh, like you need to have some guts uh, to pull the crowd, and the sir has that capacity also, uh, I think. Uh, Otherwise, you know, because our university, different parallel sessions runs all across the uh, campus uh, every day. And students are like, uh, they are running away from conferences and seminars and talks. Uh, because they come only for at the time of samosa. But today we are not providing, OK? <laughs> so that is one thing. Uh, so but I, from bottom of my heart and on behalf of my department, University of Hyderabad, I would like to thank all the dignitaries who have come outside my university. I could see many people coming from Bangalore and other places. I think it's very impressive and it's encouraging for me to thank them. And then our students from all the discipline, not only social science, I could see some of the software people also coming here. OK, so this is very encouraging. And I am thankful to all of you before starting the talk. And now, the reason for this is that everyone of us know that, uh, unfortunately, people from Manipur have got many, you know, uh, name and fame for the country like India, like Mirabai Chanu, Mary Kom, we talk about. But still, people find it difficult to locate where is Manipur. But Manipur has been become very popular for the unfortunate reason because of the kind of uh, conflict which has been running for the last three months. Because of that, now even grocery shop people also know that uh, where is Manipur. So that is not the good sign. But even then, but one way Manipur has been known by everyone for the unwanted reason. And another thing which I want to tell you that because over the three months we have been seeing, and um, our students must be seeing that there is uh, different narratives which have been built around these issues and uh, in different platforms, which requires a serious scrutiny. Because people just go by certain things which is posted in media and the, you know WhatsApp groups and Facebook and the, and this kind of mushrooming and multiple platform which is spreading all across the social media and other platforms rather created more confusion among the people. So there's a need for in social science we talk about the uh, triangulation of data if you want to have a validity of the information. So it, so in that context we need to have a, some kind of triangulation of information so and then in other uh, we keep telling to our students that uh, when we teach students that when you see if i put a blue goggles and I see this audience now i will see them as a blue color and if i put the red color goggles and i will see them as a red color but actually the reality is different so everyone seems to see this issue from the diff by wearing different glasses so please remove for time being that glasses and see from the plain glance and try to understand the reality of actually what is happening there. So in this juncture, the considering the importance of this topic, I would like to have a, our speaker, Dr. Vimal Akujam, who is a associate professor in the Center for the Study of Social System. And I just came to know that actually I was assuming that sir is, uh, sir is a basic course is from the political science, but I came to know that he's from psychology. And another very interesting is he's a multifaceted personality, not only academician. That's why that is the reason why he's so popular. <laughs> because uh, when uh, he just uh, shared me uh, some of the things which he has done, and in anthropology we talk about a holistic approach. Uh, he's same like holistic package, person with uh, you know complete man since uh, 1947, like Raymond. Because he has, it's a, basically I do anthropology and I am unilinear kind of thing. We do on this thing and then we can't go beyond that. But he is the kind of person who engages in the academic and which is also he make marks in his own field and he works as a social worker also and uh, he's a public orator and apart from that he is a film director. So I am just wondering uh, what kind of assignment is there and whether you sleep or not, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> Uh, because uh, I was just going through his CV, and he has already produced uh, more than four documentary movies, which are very sensible, and which are very concerned with the society you know, around all of us. So now I can keep on talking about Sir because uh, I am very thrilled to introduce him. But I can't go long because it will be like you know, before uh, you know, when you want to watch a very good movie, and if you are so seeing some that uh, you know, cancer wala advertisement which comes on the television, no. Then you feel irritated, so I I don't want to be like that. Okay, so now I would like to request or Vimal sir to come and deliver his talk, 
and uh, I think uh, I, I small request before sir starts the topic. Uh, it will after he talk, it will be followed by the question and answer. But please ask the questions on the pure academic merit. Don't get emotional, okay? Because that is a very it's because it doesn't have a space for university. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ramesh and uh, Dr. Padur Aparao, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, before I go ahead with my uh, lecture, may I request all of us to stand for a minute uh, to for the departed uh, uh, people from my home state, cutting across uh, communities in this very unfortunate and tragic event that has unfolded in the last three months. For one minute, let's keep a silent tribute to all our victims. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, the Rumi says that one should not be emotional, but we can't help to feel the pain. And you're, you can be charged of, I don't mind if you have those emotions coming in. Incidentally, uh, one of my writings, uh, which is in press right now, is the place of emotion in social sciences. You know, in our social sciences, we know that uh, in Western modernity, it is the intellect, the cosito, that drive us rather than the effect. And quite often, we miss the truth of human reality precisely because we have exercised our emotional attachment to the issues that we face in life. So I think I wouldn't mind even if you get very, very emotional in your questions, and you should feel it for right or wrong, uh, because I, this is one of the things that I say, what has happened in Manipur, even though I'm out of my home state for almost four decades now, I still feel it very, very dear to my heart, and it feels the pain. And I must tell you, despite all the propaganda that has been going on, I have my colleagues, my students, who come from the other community, so to speak. Uh, it's sad to see the kind of tension that has built up among ourselves. Uh, that must also be recognized and acknowledged. And I believe firmly that, as like politics, they said, is the art of the possible. And a human being and ourself is not an end product. It is a process. So when Aristotle says we are a political animal, one must realize that both our self as well as our political existence is a dynamic process. So you shouldn't think that this is the end of the story. We can always think about positive outcome in the days to come, however difficult it is. It is not impossible to craft a new form of relationship. Though I believe that, also I said this on some of my lectures and public talk, uh, we should not undermine the scars that this will have. You know, you must have heard this Urdu couplet was about Rahim Dhaga Premka. Have you heard that one? No? The threat of love, uh, it, it, once it's broken, it can still be uh, joined together, but you will have that sign of the note. Uh, we might have that scar in the days to come because this is going to be very, very deep. But I think I believe in human ingenuity and reflexivity and possibility of a future where we can come over as human society and humanity has seen worse forms of violence in, in history, you know it very well. My homestead has also witnessed 
uh, the notorious clash between the Nagas and Kukis, where thousands have suffered, hundreds have been slaughtered. Uh, so I think we can still come over these things. Salvation experience with the partition, the Holocaust, it still lingers on. Partition is not past, it is in the present. The estranged relationship between Pakistan and India is a sign of that continuing sense of estrangement that was created by that violence in 1947. Uh, and, and, and so-called riots in India between the Hindus and Muslims is also an indication of that estranged relationship. But at the same time, uh, it is not as worse or, or, or as it was in 1947. We do have a relationship now. So I believe in that human potential for a new form of politics. Now what I shall do to today here is I lay out about the issues in Manipur and I have deliberately chosen the topic to call it Manipur Mehe beyond the communal haram. So let me define what is communal here. I use it in the sense as Bipan Chandra would use it in the context of partition. Communalism is nothing but an idea that simply because we differ in terms of religion, in terms of language, in terms of whichever social identities we have, we cannot have a common destiny together. That kind of an ideology is what Bipan Chandra called it communalism. So I'm going to speak beyond that kind of a logic. I do not believe that the cookies or, or whichever name you call it, Mar and the hyphenated identities, or the Maitais and the Pangals and the, all the other tribals called the Nagas, I don't believe that they cannot live together. I don't believe that they cannot have a common destiny. Uh, you know, that is what, if you believe that they cannot have a common destiny, this is precisely what is being called communal project. You remember about two nation theory, both propounded by the Hindu rights as well as the Muslim League. And I don't think that uh, that, is, uh, that is true. We can still possibly live together without, uh, I'm not saying that we can't have problems, we can't have conflict. Conflict is part of life, but it depends on how we manage those conflict. Uh, so that is the, the thing that I, I, I want to share with you here today. <coughs> So I have, you know, uh, this is lovely poem by Vikram Said. When he says, I want to explain something, blah, blah, he goes on in one of his sweet poetry <coughs> and he said, speak later, state your premise first. I believe that whatever we understand, some of you know that this has been a debate in social sciences. In the positivist, empiricist sense, you always think that uh, what we are grappling with is a reality that exists out there and the scientific theories are representing that objective reality. That kind of a position would challenge, as you know very well, starting with physics in, in the crisis that you had at the beginning of the 20th century on quantum physics, when Heisenberg started saying that it is not the nature itself that we see, but nature is exposed to our method of questioning. So this Cartesian dichotomy between the observer and the observer is not sustainable, more so in social sciences. There will always be a premise from where you are looking at things. So I want to lay out my premise first. There's a four things that I want you to be very conscious of it. First one is that this violence has a notorious site, which many of you, I don't know whether you're aware of it or not. Huge propaganda. There's an information war. You have to be very cautious about the kind of information that you get. It. Huge information war. There's a disinformation campaign going on, and you should be very careful about the kind of information you get before you absorb the things. It is also partly because you know that we exist in a world which we call a post truth world, where facts are not that important, but it is more of a perception management and emotion takes over. This is what we call it post truth. And you also know familiar with this phrase called watch up universities. So you must be very careful about the kind of information you get it before taking any decisions. And this crisis suffered from that disinformation. I will share with you, for example, as a simple fact, as when did this violence begin? 
It has two sides. The first side is that, as a historian would know that, when you write a history, the beginning and the end, it's a perspective followed by the historians that will decide. So for example, if you look at it, when did Second World War begin? Will we start with the day when the clandestine German army killed their own soldiers at the border between Poland and the, uh, Germany? Or will you count in the emergence of Hitler as a leader of uh, Germany? How do you write the history of Second World War? It depends on the perspective you will choose the beginning. So if you wanted to see about the beginning of this violence, for example, so how do you choose? What kind of information you have? So I'll share with you where did it begin, okay? And the contradictions and the information flows, and I'm going to share with you, uh, you know, a couple of video clips and see. Did it start in Infant? Or did it start somewhere else? What is the information that you have on the 3rd of May? Let's see this video where first I'll share with you Dr. Mary Grace Jo, who is the convener of the Cookie Women's Forum, what she has to say when she was talking to Karen Thapar. Is it sound there? There's no sound. Uh-oh. It's not working? Or otherwise, should I skip it? Otherwise, leave it. I'll start. Anyway, uh, you can check this later on. This clip is available in, in YouTube as well. This is the interview of uh, this lady, uh, Dr. Mary Grace Jo. She said that the violence started in Infal on 3rd May. That's what she said in the interview. And on the other hand, you have your uh, one of your faculty here, Professor Swan wrote on 6th of May in Indian Express that it did not start in Infal, it starts the border between uh, Churan Champur and uh, Bisnupur district. So you have two versions, one who is saying that it started in Infal, the other is saying that it doesn't start with that one. And even Professor Suwan's take on 6th May, the way he described in his article in, in the Indian Express, you will see that it is completely different when she, he narrated in June 12 in the diplomat. Two of his excerpts, you will see that it's not the same person. The same person saying about how did it begin, you will have two different versions. On the 6th of May, what he wrote in Indian Express and in his interview and the diplomat, there are two different versions of that one. In the Indian Express, he says that there is a retaliatory violence uh, because the, some people have beaten a Maitai guy in Churan Champur because he tripped over, he, he ran over you know, water which is kept for the rally, uh, and he was beaten up. And in, in reactions to that violence, uh, Maitais have burned down uh, you know, some villages of the uh, you know, Kuki tribes uh, and, and uh, the, the memorial cave. That's what he said. Uh, on the other hand, in, and when he wrote in 12, his narrative change. He says that the rally was blocked by the Maitai's counter blockades and some of the uh, Kuki uh, rally people were beaten up by the Maitai's. In reactions to that, uh, there was a retaliatory violence by the Kuki's on the Maitai houses and so on. That's the image. So he has two different versions. One he wrote on, this is all available in print. You can check it out. Uh, one is what is written in. But the same narrative, all the three will remain. One thing is that the violence was sought to be blamed on the Maitais in all the three. 
So one saying that it's an infall, one saying they know it's not an infall, it's the border between us. But the account shifted in 12 June by Professor Swan himself. So you can check this. So what I'm saying is, so what is the truth? Where did the violence begin and why it began? You have to think about it. I'm not going to make a judgment on that for you. You do it yourself. Because you have to have the discretionary power to think why a person is writing two different versions on two different occasions and why the lady is saying that it started in Infal. But the commonality among all the three versions is that Maitais are responsible. But if you look at the Indian Express news on the 4th, it clearly tells you something. Can I have the clip that doesn't have a sound? As you see that the newspaper report, if you check on Indian Express, it, it says that it is violence started in the border between the Vishnupur district and Churachampur, how it started. And, and uh, he says that the violence started there. And the first report of the Indian Express, if you see, it says uh, certain uh, you know, houses belonging to a particular community was burned down in Vishnupur district. That's the word. The journalists did not identify the community. But I said, in the late in the evening, there is a other sporadic violence started spill over. It's okay, now you can check this. This is the fourth um, uh, Indian Express um, news. It is in page number nine. It did not have the headlines on the front page. And it talks about the violence started in that area. And it says that some houses belonging to a particular community was burned down. But interestingly then, the news report goes on to say that as a reaction to that, sporadic violence started happening in the other parts of the state, including in Imphal in the evening. And it says that some miscreants started burning down tribal houses. And what I found it interesting is when the Maitai houses were burned down in Torbung areas, in the afternoon on the 3rd, the newspaper only mentioned houses of a particular group was burned down. But when it comes to uh, the, 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 the reactions in the afternoon, in the evening, in Imphal and other places, it's identified this one. This is against the Press Council of India's ethical standard you're not supposed to mention. It seems to follow in the first line, but it did not follow. Uh, we, we are doing a, a group of us have been analyzing these news. And hopefully uh, the report will be coming out very soon about the way in which the national media have reported the crisis. The editor guilt of India has warned that the press should not be part of, vis-a-vis -vis with this Manipur crisis, that you should not be part of the information war, which has been going on. But unfortunately in our analysis, uh, especially the national media, see, if some paper published from Churachampur or Mizoram or, or Imphal gets biased, you can understand because they are part of the conflict situations. Why should the national media have a position, partition position on this one? And that's a particular question. I'll come to this later on. So that's the first thing, my first premise is that there has been an information war that has been going on. So when you absorb things, you have to exercise your discretionary power to see what is facts and what is fictions and so on. The next one is, uh, is that you know, there is a binaries. Uh, oh, before that, you know this country, we have been going through this Hindutva versus non-Hindutva, leftists, rightists. I often say uh, for people like us in the Northeast, it's not about left and right. It is a hierarchical relationship because we all are at the margin and we are not on the left side or the left side, you know. So I often say that don't try to apply your categories on us. Leftists and the rightists, we have a different location in the Indian state. We are the periphery of the national consciousness. Many of you know that, and since many of you are from anthropology, I have written this in 2006 in one of my paper called uh, Bharat to India to Bharat via India. I have said this, uh, you know, India was not a historical subject in the Western scholarship because of the colonial episteme, because we are called, in the Hegelian sense, people without history, the race of the historian. So you see, remember the Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay says, we must have a history, because that sense of 
invisibility in the eyes of the Western epistemology is something that you react. Uh, so uh, we are historyless people. So India become a historical subject, with, particularly with the Battle of Plassey and afterwards, because Europeans started ruling certain places. Bengal, you know that the company took over after the Battle of Plassey. Uh, and, and, and that's how the India becomes sort of a historical subject because of their encounter with the Europeans. But we have been part of anthropological subject. South Asian is an anthropological subject because anthropology deals with the primitive other, the non-European and so on. You have this colonial heritage with this discipline, anthropology. And Patho Chatterjee and Ashish Nandi, all of these South Asian scholars have been telling us that there is a continuity between the colonial and the post-colonial in South Asia. You know that Indian law, IPC, Indian Police Act, all of them are constructed by the colonial regimes. And now Prime Minister Modi is talking about decolonizing ourselves. You remember that. So there is a continuity between colonial and post-colonial. And I have been arguing this for the last two decades. Then one classic example of that continuity is the way you treat the Northeast, India's Northeast. It has been sort of exiled from the history and it has been a very prominent feature in anthropology. I said there is a historical absence of the Northeast we're still talking 75 years of India's independence. We're talking about inclusion of the history of the Northeast India into the national text. Why it has not been included? Because it's a primitive people. They don't have history. You understand this one, the logic. But we have been an anthropological subject. You can check in Indian anthropological literature. So I often said this, and I'm quoting from my own article, I said, the historical absence is complemented by the anthropological presence of the India's Northeast. So that's a particular framing in the which Northeast has been done. So in that sense, you need to know that, and because of the national politics in the mainstream about Hindu Tuva versus leftist, rightist, you try to fix this problem in Manipur in terms of the same binary categories. By virtue of the Maitais, majority of them being Hindus, or a certain kind of Hinduism that they practice, which is some people call it Manipuri Vaishnavism. You think that they are Hindu. Simply because of being a Hindu becomes a fault. You know, is it, is it, we have done some uh, sorry, some crimes because you are a Hindu. So you have been clapped as a Hindu and you must be guilty and you must be doing kind of a projection is being done. And the cookies are Christians and stuff like that. Then Hindu and Christians point you are missing that it is not about Christian and Hindus in one level. In painting that picture, so I would like to suggest that, for example, uh, you know, I had brought the video over for you, but I will not show it now because the sound is not working. I'll give you two examples. That Koki's rebel groups who are in the suspension of operations, many of them have come out and I have the paper, a press release issued by them, saying that how BJP and they have tied up so that they work for BJP to make sure that their candidate win in the hill areas, these kooky groups. And when the kooky intellectual was asked in a Turkish interview, television, he says, what is your relationship with the RSS and BJP? He said, we have a very cordial understanding with the BJP and RSS. Now, the point is that people have been saying that Maitais are part of these Hindu forces and uh, attacking the Christian minorities and so on. It's far more complicated pictures. It is there. You can see this. And on the other hand, you will see Maite is, uh, you know, uh, protesting against uh, Prime Minister's silence and you know, breaking radios on Monkey Bar or burning Chief Minister's Birin's uh, effigy. And you think that all Maites are supporting uh, Chief Minister Birin. If they are supporting, then why do they have this protest? And the latest one, I saw a video in which one woman was shouting, we will come in your CM bungalow and strip naked in front of you. You are failing us to protect us. So things are much more complicated. This lazy category of Hindu Christians and you know, Hindu forces and others. Of course, there are uh, committed workers uh, of RSAs and BJPs uh, among the Maitais. And this is an a, like all. You have leftists among Maitais. You have Congress 
people among my tastes. So why would you brand people as this one? It's a far more complicated story. So I think it is a lazy category, you know, that, that you try to initially fix as if it is in the rest. So you miss the dynamics. So please be aware of this one. This is the second premise that I'm sharing. Yes? An extension of that is the third premise that I want to share with you is this binary of minority and majority is a discourse that you have in the rest of the country. How does it fit in into Manipur? Or for that matter, tribal and non-tribal. How does it fit in? If you know as an anthropologist how this category called tribal is a colonial category, how it is harmful, like Professor Kaka and others have been saying it, you have a very easy, lazy category of clubbing them. So when you think about minority, majority in the national discourse, the Muslim is 14.2%, for example, Hindu is roughly around 80%. Does it work in Manipur in minority, majority? Take, for example, in the 19, 2011 census, might I, uh, how much population is there in the entire state? You say 53, you're mistaken, that's a linguistic. The, the one who speaks Maitai Long. But you have Muslims in that one, which is slightly a little over 8% and so on. So if you really check the Maitais, because Maitai Pandals or Manipuri Muslims are a distinct community. They are not involved in this crisis as, as of now. So you can see this. So if you minus that, Maitai actually is around 43 to 45% of the entire population. Is 45% majority? What is the population of the tribal in the state? 40.33. So when 40 and then 43, which is, does it fit into your minority and majority category? And what is this 43? There are boxes in, in a less than 10% of the state's territory. Which is more marginalized and disadvantaged? Think logically and think about it. Now you said there are at the secretary level how many SC and STs are there? And I was checking it. There are barely two, three secretary level IS officers in the national government. And you check many of the other states where the tribal populations are there. And you see what is the presence of the tribal in the bureaucracy decision making level. Out of the 20 top police officers, Presently serving, when the crisis began, there are three Maitais. Around 11 or 12 of them are tribal. So which, which one is a minority in the bureaucracy? You need to talk about it and you said, as if it is a Maitais who have crafted this. Now you said 40, you call it Maitais. It's not Maitais, this is unreserved sin. You know the vocabulary in Indian constitution. And 19 ST reserve. People said 20 is wrong, only 19. There is an unreserved seat called Kangpopi, where Maitais can fight elections. There was in 1981, Nepali also uh, was represented as a MLA of that area, Kishor Thapa, in 1980. So it's an unreserved seat, though it is dominant uh, scheduled tribe, so you will always have scheduled tribe winning from that. So actually it's 19 ST seat reserve and one SC reserve seat, which is Sekmai. So out of 60 members, there are 20 reserve, one for the SC and 19 for the scheduled tribe. How is this done? Like all India constitutional norms, it's proportionate to the population of the ST in that state. It's across the country. So in parliament, for example, you have 47, if I remember correctly, ST seats which is, comes around 8.6% of the total Lok Sabha seats, which is reserved for the Sedul tribe, which is in proportional to the overall population of ST in this country, which is around 86 again. You understand what I'm saying? So what has been decided was based on 1961 census, because Manipur was inaugurated as a full-fledged state in 1972, so the 71 census was not operational at that time. So it was based on 1961 census, where the proportion of the tribal population is 31.34%. So the seat 19 out of 60 is 31%. That's how the reservation was done. That's not done by the Maitais to dominate. That's a constitutional mechanism. You communalize this perspective. Now what is this dominance in the political? You have chief ministers, two tribal chief ministers, 
One of them used to be the longest serving. And there was a Muslim, which is barely less than uh, you know, 2%, who also produced a CM. And every cabinet, you can see members in the decision-making body, tribal ministers, including who handles Hill Affairs Ministers. You check it and you do a corresponding comparative analysis of the tribal states. Please be my guest. Please go ahead and check Nagaland. How many of them are in bureaucracy from the Eastern Nagaland? I know because one of my students, she was the first uh, from her community to get a PhD from Eastern Nagaland. And I met her to do a survey work. This backward tribe, they call it in uh, uh, Eastern Nagaland. How many of them are in the cabinet ministers? How many of them are in the bureaucracy? You will see a completely different pictures. Be my guest, go and check Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh. How many STs are there in bureaucracy? How many STs are there in their cabinet ministers? Take a tribal areas like Orissa. This is a picture that you need to do an objective analysis of the discourses has been completely communalized. So when you think about the tribal and the non-tribal and the uh, minority and majority, you have to be very careful uh, in, in order to understand. So these are the three major and the fourth and the last concern that you should have. When I said that there is no vision from Nowhere. Visions are always from somewhere. You know, in social sciences, we call it location. You know, your gender, your caste, your ideology, your disciplinary training, all of them sort of influences the way you formulate the question, you see the reality. Or as Michel Foucault would say, there is an episteme behind the question that you raise in your research work as well. Because the fact that you don't ask A questions, but rather ask B question is determined by what he calls an episteme. There is a worldview behind it which makes you ask a particular kind of a question. So that whole Newtonian physics of saying that as if you see things from nowhere, one recognizes today in social sciences particularly that whatever we see is always from some vantage point, some positions. So I should be honest enough to tell you that my location, you must know where I'm coming from. That I am a Maite is definitely a point to be noted. Whatever I speak, you must always have a question mark. Be critical. Check it because Professor Bimal is a Maite. And there is no pretensions about this one. And you must be asking, similarly in social science training, we were asked what we call a reflexivity. So I keep on asking, whatever I am saying it, what it has to do with my maite that's what we are supposed to be aware. Okay, so I just as I as a researcher trying to reflect on myself and try to figure out whichever vision that I have, whichever question I raise, has it something to do with my maintenance? And I say, yes, there is. One of the things that I discover is I am very, very passionate about the idea of Manipur. I can set tears in my eyes if something happened to my home state. And some people may not have this feeling. But I can tell you that most Maitais have this patriotic attachment to this idea of Manipur. They cry. I have seen people crying in the last three months. They are ready to kill. They are ready to die for this place. They don't care. And that, I realize that I have this one. That vantage point, uh, as a Maitai, I have that one. And two, because of my location as a Maitai, I also started asking, but this Manipur is not only about Maitais. Then why do Maitai say this kind of thing or this kind of thing? I started asking. So I have wrote this long time back. It's not today's. Because if you have been critical about Indian nationalism or nationalism as such, forget about Indian nationalism. Nationalism as an ideology. If you're doing it, you know, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, for example, is very skeptical about the idea of the nation and nationalism, though we still call it national poet. India has a very, uh, you know, paradoxical situation. I must share with you this one. The guy who is very skeptical about nationalism per se, we call him national poet. 
And the person who is very, very skeptical about the idea of state, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, when he went for uh, you know round table conference, when he was asked by a British journalist, what is the India of your dream? You know, one of the things that he said, among many others, he said, India of my dream shall be a country with the smallest army imaginable. Today we have one of the largest army in the world and we still call Gandhi the father of the nation. <laughs> that's, a, that's a paradox. You know when the Indian army goes to fight with the Pakistani? With this patriotic zeal, we sing a song written by the national poet of Pakistan. You sing his song and you kill Pakistan. <laughs> That's a very funny paradoxical situation in South Asia, you must know. Uh, Tagore incidentally also has this unique record in the world of having composed and written two national anthems. Bangladesh, Omar Sona Bangla, is Rabindranath Tagore and Janakana says, and he also uh, gave the tune to Sri Lanka national anthem. So he is a unique guy. That one. That's a South Asian peculiarity that you must keep in mind. Uh, so when you look at that, I'm very skeptical about nationalism, including Maitai nationalism or Manipuri nationalism, this cartography and so on. So I, I've been questioning. So I've written what I call it monochromatic history of Manipur. A Maitai-centric, state-centric historiography must be debunked. And I've been doing this, not recently, for almost two decades. You seek my writing, you will see this. And I've also called, many of these Maitai suffer from what I call it, imperial nostalgia. You tend to think that that area used to be our kings, you know, like in Burma we have places. I said, you can't have an imperial possession these days because this is a modern republican democratic ideas. Everybody is equal, we are all citizens. Everybody deserves dignity and freedom. Whoever is whichever community. So you must question these things in order to liberate yourself so that you can form relationship another with fellow people. If you have heard my interview with Karan Thapar, for example, I have said that I do not like to call my fellow citizens as outsiders. I have been consistently saying this, not today, for a long, long time. And I have also said, if you remember in my speech in public meeting when I opened up for the first time in gentleman, I said, do not hit the cookies as a community as a whole. Just pick up the politics and the elites who are doing this politics. But I can see, I'm aware that there is a much more deeper angle. And I can see this and I feel very uncomfortable with this. You get it, sir? So I, you know, you have to inquire yourself where you're coming from. That's what I am sharing with you. What I'm going to share with you is coming from being a Maite, but I am a Maite who is also very conscious and started questioning my premise constantly. And I dream of a united Manipur belonging to that passion in which I grew up. And I said, I feel very emotional about it. I can also die for my home state. I still call it home. 40 years. You understand this attachment. So many of this, I thankfully there was an article in Indian Express the other day that this depth seems to have recognized now. I can tell you that Maitais will die ready to kill for this idea of Manipur because it's a centuries old memories and association with that state. And I have seen this on the ground. I have seen because I have visited three, four times. I spent longest stay was during this crisis, around 10 days I stayed. I went to the border areas where this crisis happened. I've seen people. Like for example, you know this Sanabun, we call it, I don't know what is that called in English. This is like a port where you put water. So every household has that one. I was asking, why is this? Every gate of every house with leaves around that, you know, like the, the way you do puja, that Brahmins keep that one, no? Water and then you have some leaves around. Like that, every house on the road. And I ask, there's an anthropological delight, by the way, if you do ethnographic work. When I go, and that's it's a war. This is a war. This is for the best wishes of our sons and, you know, who are going to fight and defend ourselves. This is only happens during war time. So that I saw it in my, in, 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 on the film this time. So people have a very different emotions and attachment. So I said the last premise that I'm sharing with you is that whatever I speak today, 
please keep in mind that Amaita is speaking to you. And I, I've already let you know two aspects of that Maitainess. My emotional attachment, my patriotic attachment to that state, for which I can also be very, very extreme at one point. I have already said to myself in publicly, when the push comes to shop, then there has to be certain things to be done. And then I think uh, that is something that I know it. But the other side is that I am not going to be blinded by certain kind of ideologies because I'm thinking about a political imagination, a new form of imagination where people can live with dignity and well-being. Everybody. That is the kind of an idea that I come from. So with this, I want to share with you today four things that, um, uh, you know, uh, about this problem. So first thing is I call it the idea of Manipur and the separate administrations, demand for separate administration. I wanted to share some ideas on this one. So what is Manipur? How do we begin with it? You know, you can always choose to begin from Paleolithic sites to Neolithic sites. There are available literatures on this one. First of all, you need to know a little bit about geography. Okay? A lot of us have this mistaken ideas. You know, if you look at the class 19 textbook of the NCRT, there's a Himalayan, you know, how many of you, I don't know, are you aware of this, how the Himalayans were formed? There's a collision between the Indian plate and Eurasia plate, the trip of the continental. When it collided roughly around uh, 50 million, do you have that picture with you? Huh? You can show that one. And collided and Himalayan comes up because of that collision and it still continues. That's why it is an aquip one area. But that movement of the plate is still going on and Himalayan is still growing up. So you can see this is uh, how that uh, Himalayan is formed. Can you see this one? Uh, if I can show you here. When the collision happened like this, this has come up. And this Arunachal, it turns, this is what they call it, Eastern Himalayan region. And it comes down Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, then Arakan ranges, and it goes all the way to Andaman Nicobar Island. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, this lifted one, this is part of that range. And they said the collision, uh, it was pressed a little bit towards the eastern side. And that is why uh, higher ranges of the mountains are on the eastern rather than on the western front. And also the, uh, you know, in, in that collision, there was a depression, you know. And that depression through millions of years, there's a rainfall bringing in sedimentation. That's why indo gangetic plain is a very fertile plain that appeared out of that one. Brahmaputra Valley, as we call it, is actually an extension of this one. Why it is narrowed down is because of the eastern pressing of that one. So it is actually an extension of that one. If you see in this geography, Manipur is part of that mountainous region. Can you continue this short? Is there that? This is Manipur. Can you see? This is the valley. You talk about hill and valley divide. People think it's like Uttarakhand and Allahabad or Banaras. That relationship is not the reality. If you see that Banaras and all others are part of the plain, born out of that depression. But here, this is not out of that depression. It is part of the mountainous region. You have many valleys in the mountainous region. Am I right? It could be like as small as this room. It could be big as a football ground. It could be bigger than that one. So this is what in, in geologists call it Central Valley of Manipur. What you call it today politically, Manipur Valley, Imphal Valley, you use different terms. And you will be surprised to know that this is part of the lifted part. If you see, for example, there is Guwahati, which is part of Brahmaputra Valley. This is roughly around 50 meters above sea level, 50, 50. And the Naga Hills, Kohima, is 1,500 roughly meters. Is almost 30 times higher. And similarly, Mizoram, Aizol is also 1,200 roughly. It is mountain versus the plain. Can you see what I'm, I'm saying? But unlike that, Imphal is the Everest is 790 meters. You can see the difference? This is part of the mountainous lip. Shivalik region, Dharagun and others is also around 700. You call it mountainous region. Imphal is higher. You understand this? So it's part of a mountainous region. 
And do you know what is Tura Champur, by the way? I'll show you. Look at my finger. This is Tura Champur. Is it hill or is it a valley? Valley. It's a valley. His height is 820 meters. The difference is 120 roughly. That's why Karan Thakur was shocked. When I said, well, I never knew that. He said, it's like you're calling Empire Building in New York. The ground floor is valley and the second and third floor is hills. So that's as absurd as that. That's what he said. And that's the, the, the this is Rural Jampur. You can see this one. The district headquarter is actually an extension of the Oval Valley. Can you see? This is Loktakli. Imphal is here. So you are talking about hill and valley as if it is a distinction between Allahabad and Uttarakhand and you know, Himalayas. We are talking about the mountainous region and you are going to separate this from here? And there are many hills like this in between also. All this thing you are going to have a different state like this? Am I making sense what I said? This is the mountainous region. And this is Torbung is where the violence started. It's on way to Ifal. This is Loktang Lake. Ifal is the other side of this one. It's okay now. So what I'm saying is, you have to have certain clarity about the geography. And uh, this was recognized by the Planning Commission, National Development Council in 1965, former committee. And they were trying to figure out how to have a special planning program for hill areas in the country. You know, you have hilly regions in different parts of the country. So they came up with a criteria to define what is hilly region, you know. Itna taluka mein, if you have this much of the hill area, then you should be declared as a hill subdivision and so on. You know, the percentage and so on, they counted. And they came up with these two categories, hill state and state with hill areas. Can you see the difference? Hill state and state with hill areas. Can you guess? Where is Manipur according to that planning commission category? Is it state with hill areas or hill state? It's classified as hill state. Quite obviously it is part of that mountainous range. So they have Jammu and Kashmir, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram and Meghalaya. These are classified as hill state. And it is 100% hill state uh, because of this Hilly region, and it, you can see one more thing that all this state they have name is part of the Himalayan ranges that you know is produced by that collision of the continental drift. Now, Assam, for example, unlike that, Assam was defined as a state with hill areas. They have this new Kachar, you know, hill areas, Karbi along, and others. So does Chhattisgarh. Many of these things are called state with hill areas. Maharashtra is also a state with hill areas. So this distinction is done. In this kind of a topographical features, you are talking about hill versus plain, as if you are talking about these Allahabad versus Uttarakhand, Naya State Ban Gaya, Uttar Pradesh and Nikal Ke, because it was a reason for the other reason. Can you use the same category? Unfortunately, this is what the Britishers have done. Because in Assam, the Brahmaputra Valley and Naga Hills and the Lusai Hills. Lusai Hills became later on Mizoram. And Naga Hills become Nagaland. So the relationship between Brahmaputra Valley, Guwahati and Kohima, Naga Hills, and the relationship between the Guwahati and the Lusai Hills, they almost apply similar kind of perspective. When as if the relationship between Imphal and Ukrul, Imphal and Churachampur is the same as relationship between you know Banaras and uh, Uttarakhand or Gauhati with Kohima, which is a false uh, mapping. But you know that Manipur is not only that one. They also what they did is because of this typical anthropological worldview. And I'll just read out uh, which is typical of that view. Uh, one of their British record, uh, it, it captures, where is that? Too many papers are here. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I have kept it. I've taken a photocopy, but I'm going to try it from the 
quotation na main kong analog for one piece of paper. This is one British official who writing, you know, that in Western European category, they have this idea of the greco roman as a civilization and the barbarism from the northern part attacking Rome and so on. You see? Rome as a civilized area and surrounded by the German tribes and the barbarians and raiding them and so on. This imagery is what they have applied and I'm reading it out what they see Manipur when they come. It says, this guy was saying, it is a British official in the 19th century, he said, I have always taken a lively interest in this singular oasis of comparative civilization and organized society set in the midst of a congress of barbarous peoples. Can you sense this one? The valley, Manipur state, and kingdom, and army, and the literature, they think it's civilized, surrounded by barbarians. The same kind of typologies they have in the Western concept. And this is where, you know, and over whom he's saying that, you know, over these barbarians around it, it its ruler exercise an authority, uh, which sort of uh, bring in a sense of advanced community in the direction of peace and order. That means the diseases, kings, and rulers of this valley exercise a certain authority and they were imposing peace and order in that area. That was, uh, you know, Sir C. Z. Lyle had written about it. And I said, Maitreyis are very happy because they have been called civilization. Am I making sense? I know that. So this distinction between civilized and the barbarians, what the British are saying, is what later on, because of that, they think, you know, these barbarians who have to be uh, you know, have a different set of laws and it should be decided by the British officials. That's how when they, uh, you know, uh, become de facto ruler, though they do not annex Manipur after 1891 war, uh, you know, they have introduced this Manipur Administration Act, uh, you know, law in 1907 and says whatever criminal and civil cases associated with the hill men will be decided by the British officer who was the president of the Darbar, Manipur State Darbar. But the rest of them will go by the Chairab court and other court regular, the non-tribals non and so on. So what were the barbarians where they think that cannot understand these rules and laws, it must be therefore decided by the British officials as a discretionary power and the others will be followed by the court, the Chairab court. So they have created in Michel Foucault's term, if I use him, two sets of subjects out of the same people. Am I making sense? So this picture refuses to accept that when the army was organized, when the conscription was done for the war and others, the people from the hill as well as this valley area, central valley area, was picked up by the king in the mobilization. You can see its records. In fact, one of the fantastic what can be used in anthropology, Bernard Cohen's uh, typologies, if I follow, there is a ritual enactment of sovereign power by the king of Manipur when he made a Lord North book. The way he carried and display himself in the presence of the British Viceroy. You know, what he did was in the front, he has these people from the hill in their one flank with the spear and others, followed by the infantry from the valley drawn up, then followed by the cavalry, then the elephant. That was he presented. This is in Lord Northbrook's uh, encounter with King Chandrakirti uh, in 19th century. And so this is what in anthropology we call it the ritual sovereignty. This idea of a ritual sovereignty being displayed by him. So you can see that there is a relationship between the people in this upland and the lowland in these mountainous regions, which we are calling hill and valley. This actually is the upland and the lowland in, in the same mountainous terrain. They have been interacting like this, conscriptions and so on. Uh, and similarly, uh, there are intermarriages happens also among them. And some of these upland people will come down, absorb in the lowland people. Lowland people will go up and become part of that. And that goes on. Even at the beginning of the 20th century, we know many of the colonies in, uh, in, in, in Imphal itself is from the upland people, or the hill people who have absorbed into the fall. And I know about, among some of the Tankus, uh, through some of my uh, friend circle, who were actually from, move up from the lowland to us and become Stankul and so on. Incidentally, my clan, Akwajam, uh, we are one of the only 
clans in the in, in among the Maitais who have now fully recorded genealogical track and you know uh, and clan. And it seems that twenty uh, seventh great grandfather, according to the lineage, was a Tankul chieftain. It seems so people say. My friend used to tell me that you are not a Maitai, you are a Tankul guy. Okay, people used to tease me. Uh, my father looks like a Tankul, you know, in his photograph, far more than I do. Uh, so people said, you know, it's you guys are part of this group and stuff like that. So this is, you know, the fusion and fission of population happens in these mountainous terrains. So that is the evolution. How did the state appear? Again, look at this. If you see from the mountainous regions, people come down in the valley. It was most of them were underwater, which is geologically established. We also found out that archaeologists have ducked up and saw this very interesting fact. Paleolithic sites were higher in the reaches and Neolithic sites are lower reaches as well as foothill and some portion in the valley. So what does this show? That it means that people come down from the Paleolithic old stone age to the new stone old age. And if you look at anthropological and historians theory on the emergence of the state, it is always the beginning of the food production, a pastoral community where the surplus of food appears and the need for regulation because food surplus plus increase in the population was the beginning of the state formation in, in human history. So you can think that, that this, this fertile lowland areas is where the state emerges and there must be many states within the contemporary state, not one singular state. Because of the surplus of food production, it is more fertile areas and so on. And population increase and people come down. And therefore, state must have emerged in multiple forms. And one of them become increasingly powerful and then absorb one and one. And that kingdom is headquartered in Kangla, in right in the heart of Imphal. So it becomes more powerful and it started absorbing many other groups and principalities. What you call Maitai today was also an amalgamation of various tribes. Say, for example, you see my name Angom Cha. It means the son of Angom. Angom is the name of a clan. In, in the past, it used to be a principality with its own king. Actually, this king was ritually retained till 90. Even today, you have an Angom Ningtho, a ritual head in the Manipur palace, because it was co-opted by the Maitai king in Kanla. Okay, so many of these Maitais have different kings and, you know, they were amalgamated by this, uh, the king with the Maitai king in the, in the heart of Kamla. So it expanded like this in the valleys and, 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 and across. So you can see by 17th, 18th century, Shan Chronicle in Burma started recording the raid by the Maitai kings and you know, stuff like that. So that's how the story is. When in my 19th century, you see British was looking for an ally in this part of the world. Scott, they sent one gentleman called Scott and he was checking, can we ally with the Assamese, the Khasis, the Nagas, and, and, and the Skukis and all of them. Then they come to this conclusion, they don't know, this, this kingdom, Manipuris are the only one you can have, a, because they said Nagas are war, warlike tribe, but they will have centuries to take to have an organized, civilized life. And, and you know, they use very gender account like Assamese, civilized, organized, and caste is civilized, organized, in some sense, political organizations, but they are effeminate to fight. This is what they, and they started calling, particularly the valley people in Manipur as the, he funnily eulogized it as, you can call them as, just as the Rasputana from the West, you can call them as the Rasput of the East. This is what in his report in the 19th century. And they also said, these guys have an inborn enmity with the Burmese. They can't see eye to eye with them, so they will be a good ally for us. That's how they form a relationship. 1762, the first agreement between East India Company and uh, Manipur King was signed, which is known as Burstead Agreement, 1762, 14 September. That's how the relationship began. And uh, you can see that they were looking for this ally. Uh, so that's the history that you have. But here, you know, one of the things that you must keep in mind, Today's state is very different from those states in the king's time. Do not think that the sovereign power of Imphal has the same sovereign power as today's state. In Eric Hobsbawm's term, today's modern nation state, each and every square centimeter of the territory is inhabited by the sovereign power. 
In those days, it's not like that. Many of these chiefs will have fair autonomy. Many of them will only come in contact with in the time of war and so on and so forth. Otherwise, they are independently existing entities. So different kind of sovereignty operates those days. You know, it's, it's not the nation state sovereign power. Some people tend to do it, uh, especially among the Metis, uh, which is what the historian call anachronism. You're reading back like today's state model in the past. It was not like that. But the fact that this king exercises this kind of ritual and political power is what this British officer said. He said, I always admire how among these barbarians he established this, the authority was exercised to bring peace and order. That's what the state is, peace and order. You don't have that one. So it's an authority. Funnily again, you know, I share with from John Stone, another British officer. He said, you know, many of the tribes in present day Kohima area, which is the Angami area, he says that they think that Manipuris are far more powerful than the British. Uh, that's what John Stone was laughing at. You know, by these people in Angami area, they think that Manipuris are far more powerful than the British. You know, he said, why? He said, because if you touch a village or kill somebody who is under the suggested power of the king in Imphal, in the Naga Hill areas, if you touch anybody, these people will come from Imphal, the, they will send the truth and no one will survive in that village. They will slaughter. That, uh, that, that kind of a punishment is very brutal. That's why they don't touch. And interesting, they also give another example, Johnstone, which is, doesn't reflect nicely on uh, cookies as such. He says, you know, cookies were part of many of these conscripts. So he said, we send to the Chachat region. This is in James Johnstone's book uh, in Naga Hills and Manipur in these Naga Hills. He talks about, they said, and they said, you know, they sent a troop, one of the unit which went to a village to attack, came back with the women and children, but not a single man. And Johnstone made this point. These women and children would not have come had it only been the cookies were sent there. The women and children were brought back because among them, Maitai soldiers were there. You know, he was trying to distinguish about this. This is in Johnstone's book. You can just check it. Anything I say as a research scholar, check. And whatever colonial writer says, do not take them on face value. You see, there is a particular way in which they perceive that's not part of my discussions today. You can check it, how to read colonial literature. Okay. So if you think about that, Manipur uh, has that one. Uh, and this state evolved. And then form a particular entity uh, is clearly said even today. If you look in Schedule 1 of the Indian Constitution, entry number 19, where the Manipur state is defined, check it. You will see the difference with the definitions of other. That Manipur is not a product of Indian constitution. India, Indian state did not create Manipur state. It is recorded in the Indian constitution itself. It says Manipur, it says, the territory which was administered as if it were a chief commissioner's province before the commencement of this constitution under the name Manipur. That's the definition of Manipur in the Indian constitutions as it exists today. It says that it existed, this is a territory that existed before the commencement of this constitution itself. This is what the Indian constitution says about Manipur. So it was an entity. Now to cut a long story short, why is it so, where did it become a chief commissioner's province? Is 15th of October 1949, when the dominion government took over the administration of the state from the Maharaja under a controversial Maja agreement signed on 21st September 1949 in Shillong. That's how Manipur became part of the Chief Commissioner's problems. You can go back and track it down, how this state evolved. And so this is a state. And you also know that Manipur was the only state which had a constitution of its own, an assembly constituted through the first adult franchise elections in the entire South Asia, and some even say even in Southeast Asia. It was inaugurated on 18 October 1948, a fully elected assembly. Incidentally, the first speaker of that house was a Paiti from Churachampur area. His name is Tiankha, who was a speaker of that house. So it was a constitutional monarchy 
uh, and already existed. And for rest of you, I wanted to supply one more line and before I go ahead uh, about Manipur uh, in, in this sense. This entity called Manipur, as I said, it has in a monarchical state and how it became a civil commissioner after the merger agreement uh, was implemented on 15 October 1949. There's another story that I would like to share with you this, so that you can also keep in mind a larger context. You know when the, uh, how the British came to this part of the world, 1600, they had a factory in Surat. Then till 1757, that's the first phase. They were doing business by taking farman and permission from the rulers that we, from the Marathas, from the Mughal kings. They were a business company. But after Battle of Plassey in 1757, they became a ruler, not a company. So they actually ruled Bengal and Eastern uh, Bihar part of that one, after Battle of Bakshar and so on. So very consecutively. That's the beginning of what we call it company rule. It ran for 100 years. Exactly 100 years afterwards, 1857, we had what is called the first war of independence or Sipo mutiny. The 1958, this is important for all of us to remember. You will understand something about Kashmir as well here. In, in 1758, as a consequence of that rebellion, Queen Victoria declared that I am taking over the administration of this place from the East India Company. That's a crown rule. That's what we call it British Raj. The second phase was Company Raj, and the last phase was uh, British Raj, with the British crown then taken over. One of the things that you need to remember is that it was split into two. Broadly, uh, Indian subcontinent was divided into two kinds of territory. One territory is called British India, which is directly administered by the British. They administer that place. And there are a group of territories which they call it Indian state. It's used differently. Native state, Indian state, and princely state. These are the three terms they use it. Why they call it princely state? Because they think that is, there can be only one king. That is the king of England. Rest is chota chota ruler, so they call them prince. There's a reason for this, uh, why they call it prince. You remember when the New Delhi was inaugurated? It was like a Darbar Hall. Have you, those of you who have seen Delhi, Rasatapati Bhavan is like a Singhasan of the British uh, Viceroy. You have like that Isle of the King's Court straight. Then you have this India Gate around that. Around that you have this all these princes, Hyderabad House, Dholpur House, Patiala House. This is like that one. That was designed by Luton like that. It is the geographical presentation of the new uh, you know, uh, domain of the British Raj. Uh, this is uh, a sociology or anthropology. We have visual anthropology and so on. So it's an interesting way to read the, how the visual is encoding a particular power structures. Uh, it's an interesting way to look at it. So you have these two territories. I, I hope you are following me here. Princely state and the British India. British India is directly ruled by them. Viceroys, governor general, and then you, know, you have uh, governors. So you have Madras Presidency, Mumbai, uh, Bombay Presidency, Kolkata Presidency, Chief Commissioner, Assam was under a commissioner. So these are areas they directly rule. So the other areas like Jammu and Kashmir, Hyderabad, Baroda, Bhopal, Patiala, you know, Manipur, all of these things are called princely states. They are not part of British India. So what happened is after James Paul Montague reform in 1919, they started thinking about what to do with this princely state. That they have idea of forming a body for this princely state uh, to consult and British can have a collective consultation with them. And that was inaugurated as Chamber of Princes in 1921. Okay? And they found that, that there are too many princely states because these are Jagidars. When the Mughal Empire breaks down, the smallest one I encounter is in Katiwar region in Gujarat, Saurashtra region area, with a population of 148. Even they are also called Raja. You understand that BPC was a Raja. It is a small Jagidar, you know. From that kind of small pockets to a big like Hyderabad, I'm here right now. They're supposed to be richer than France and more powerful than France at that time. You, know, you have as huge as Gujarat, uh, sorry, Hyderabad, and smallest as that 148. So they got confused what to do with this 
So many varieties, they are all called princely state. So they have decided to do something very funny. They said, let's go by the gun salute state. What does gun salute state? When they sign agreement with them, they have ranked them. So when they visit Delhi, they will fire this cannon. The highest one is 21 guns. So when the Nizam of Hyderabad comes to Delhi, Hyderabad House is still there, which is the foreign office, you know, they will fire 21 guns in his honor. Kashmir is also like that. So they have this odd number, 21, 17, 15, 13, 11, 9, 7, 5, and 3 gun salute. They have listed. And when they look at the gun salute state, it comes down from roughly 600 to around about 100, 103 if I remember correctly, maybe wrong, around that. Only that, Manipur was one of them. Manipur was an 11 gun salute state among that list. So they have formed this chamber of princes in 1921. And then next step comes, Simon Commission came for a new initiative organization of the British India and British Indian Empire. When you say British Indian Empire, it means British India plus the princely state, when you use the word British Indian Empire. But when you say British India, please mark my word, it's only those areas where they rule is straight. So they thought that we will combine them together. Simon Commission has suggested they should combine together and a federation of India must be formed. As a result of that Simon Commission report, recommendation comes the Government of India Act 1935. And Article 1 of that Government of India 1935 says Federation of India. It conceptualizes a legislature consisting of two houses. One members from the British India, the other nominated members from the princely state. And that is ironically called House of States, today's Rajasabha. But during the uh, you know, roundtable conferences, the uh, conversation broke down because many of these princely states were skeptical. What would be our power? What would be our status in this new federation? So they have withdrawn. That's why in history textbook, you will see that 1935 Act was partially implemented. Because election was held only in the British area for the first house, not for the House of State. So the princes did not join. Okay? So what happened 1935-37 then came independence period, barely 10 years later. So we have so many princely states. What to do with these things becomes a problem. Now what happened is, please keep in mind this one. Indian Independence Act 1947 did not mention anything about this princely state whether they should join or not. But it came in door, if they want to join, they can join. But there is no compulsion for them to join. That's the strategy that British have taken because they didn't want to take the decision. So legally, nothing has said about that one, but it was a political decision. So Lord Mountbatten, in the last session of the Chamber of Princes, 25th July, 1947, he told the princes, that you either join either of these two dominions, Pakistan or India, on or before 15 August. Why is that? Because if you do not join, according to the Indian Independence Act of 1947, which was passed on 18 May, they will become technically sovereign independent countries. Because that Indian independence act says the paramount power will lapse in the midnight of this one. So that is why Lord Mountbatten says you must exit to either of the two dominions depending on your proximities and so on. That story is that's what Kashmir and Hyderabad did not sign. Junagar signed with Pakistan. India did not accept. That's a story, that's a legacy. So Manipur is part of that story. So Manipur signed the accession on 11 August, before the A, and was countersigned by the governor, Representative 16. But what happened is that in that agreement of instrument of accession, which is modified from the government of India 1935, what happened is that Manipur became a problem for the rest of the country because in that instrument of accession, what you have surrendered is only foreign affairs, defense, and communication. The rest of the sovereign power, which is recognized in the instrument of accession, it says, if I, in section 7 of that one, it says, 
the sovereign power of the Maharaja over his own territory shall remain intact. So he hasn't lost his sovereignty on his, over his territory in the Westphalian Treaty sense of the sovereign power. If you remember uh, 1648 Westphalian Treaty is an idea of sovereign power attached to that. Manipur was a sovereign within that one. Though it has part become a part of the Federation of India through the accession. And that is why the government in India wanted to bulldoze and take over. They dismiss it. Unfortunately, in history, that's the problem. Manipur, Insurgency, and all of them came up because of that incident. The Maharaja was called to Shillong and was forced to sign the agreement. He keep on saying that I am a monarch, constitution monarch, I don't have the power. Let me go back to Imphal and convince my cabinet minister and the assembly. He said nothing doing to sign it. And the Indian army was sent in on 12 October 1949 to take care of any untoward incident. And then 15 October they took over and that day uh, Manipur uh, became a chief commissioner's province. That is the chief commissioner's province mentioned in uh, the schedule one of the Indian constitution. That's the history of Manipur for you. Okay. Unfortunately, Manipur was kept for 23 years under Delhi's direct rule. A state which had fought against the king to have an assembly of its own was dismissed and run. Like uh, That's why no post-colonial is supposed to be self-ruled. Manipur had a very uncanny history of repeating the coloniality of that style. And none other than G.P. Pillai, the former Home Secretary of Indian government, said that Manipur issue can be resolved very straight because we have done so many wrongs with Manipur. This should not happen. Now he said the best way is to tender an apology by either the President of India or the Prime Ministers and Manipur insurgency can be resolved. The Manipuris have been heard. They had to fight for inclusion of their language in the constitution. They had to fight for a statehood despite the fact that they were a state with an assembly and a constitution for 23 years. That's unfortunate. And they said, uh, I'm talking about G.P. Pillai, Home Secretary of India government. He said it is available on YouTube in a lecture in IDSA. He said it. And, and, and remember that when they, they started demanding for the restoration of statehood, they were wearing Gandhi Topi and Satyagraha and hunger strike. Nobody bothered. Interestingly, by that time in Naga Hills in Assam, there was this Naga nationalist movement went into armed movement as well. You know what the government of India did? They keep on saying Manipur ke experience nahi, aap kaise banoge state? Itna chota cha hai, literacy de de go, blah, blah, blah. Nagaland had the less literacy, less population, okay? And never had a history of being a state on its own was created a state and inaugurated as 16th state of India in 1963. And that sense of insult is what J.P. Pillai was saying. And it's no coincidence that UNRF, United National Liberation Front, which fought for the restoration of Manipur sovereignty, was established the next year, 1964. The language is, if you don't understand the language of Satyagraha and peaceful thing, then we better pick up arms. And many of these graffitis on the wall when I was growing up in Manipur in the late 70s and early 80s said we need bomb to make the Delhi government here. That was written on the wall. So that is why only when Manipur went into violence that Manipur was granted statehood. So that tendency to listen to violence is a mistake by the Indian state. My fear is, I'll come to this, this violence is also going to be rewarded, most likely. And its consequence, we will think about it later. So I think that's a brief idea about the Manipur and so on. Now, the other side, separate administration. You must know that, as I told you, that the Valley people, they, you know, it's like all our national mainstream, you have the mainstream. So you have a similar kind of things that the Valley is the mainstream. And it has its own problems. You remember that some people write why Muslim separatism appeared or the Dalit movement under Ambedkar and all appeared, according to some authors on Indian history, says that Indian nationalism, though Gyanendra Pandey had said that you know, around 1922, they split it. Because at the beginning, there was a mixing of the 
you know, cultural, religious mobilization along with the national movement. But in 1920s, it became two separate. Uh, this is, the, is one of his very well-known work, Construction of Communalism, uh, by Ganendra Pandey. He said, is the one is communalism, ekto, secular nationalism. as a two brands ban ke aage. One under the Congress. Congress was a platform. You have the right, live, everything is there. So become that one. It's a secular movement. And you have communal projects, the Hindu rights as well as Muslim uh, you know, separatists. All of them appeared in the 20s, mid-20s and so on. So that's how Ganendra Pandey talks about it. Now what I'm saying is that some author says that you know, Dalits and others came up in the late 20s and early 30s is because they say the so-called secular nationalist project is also inflected with upper caste Brahminical idioms. And that creates a discomfort with many other people. That's why they came up. So I believe similar kind of thing happened in Manipur. Maitai nationalist narrative inflection is there in the idea of Manipur. And that's why the non maitais feel alienated from this project to a great extent. And that is the similar kind of, there are other aspirations among different communities in Manipur. They have tried to have a different kind of a longing and they often feel that this, there is a maitai centric maitai inflection is dominant. And that is the primary tension. And this idea of a separate administration, to my mind, is a byproduct of this inflection at one level. Right from the beginning, our capacity to absorb in a, a different discourse. And we have not been able to do it, and that's why. And I look back at it, why is it so? I think one of the squarely to be found, the reason is the mother of 1949. Had it not happened, the idea of we, the people of Manipur, based on a liberal principle, whether you're a tribal or a non-tribal or from a Gao or a Shahar, or educated, uneducated women, men, everybody is equal citizens. And this coming together of citizens form the we. That is what sociologists like Michael Mann call it, we, the people in the liberal tradition, which is rooted in French revolution. The idea of individual citizens coming together and form a collective and that idea of a Manipur did not have a chance to groom because that assembly was dismissed within 11 months after its inauguration. And I had this fortune in my life. I must be the only one actually who had the video recording and a conversation with one of the members of that assembly. He's a tribal guy, Mono Monsam. I've interviewed him uh, when he was alive more than 20 years ago. And uh, I, I, I use it in my film, uh, his interview of my first documentary films. Uh, and, and you see, when I make my feature films, this tribal, non-tribal is my obsession. So my first feature film also has the hero as a tanku and the heroine as a Meite girl, you know, trying to reverse. Otherwise, Meiteis have this chingi, chan, chingi, chal, you know, like, you know, shahar kalar ka, gao ki, and that kind of thing. So the hero is always the... Maite and heroine always the you know tribal girl in many pretty popular films. So I try to reverse that. So I position the hero as a tankul guy and the heroine as a Maite girl. And which is written in one of the books, a uh, National Award winner critic who wrote my film was the first film he says where actually a tribal guy plays the protagonist. Otherwise, you know, Maite actor tends to play another tribal figure. So I choose a, a Tankul chap to play the lead role in my film. Uh, so, you know, this tribal and this has been my obsession for a long time to imagine how this, uh, uh, you know, uh, unified Manipur can be defended on which ground. But it cannot be defended on, an, uh, on any ethnocentric idea. It has to have a civic nationalist dimension. And that's why I consider Manipur is a rare opportunity Unlike all other national, ethno-nationalist movement in the Northeast, Manipur only provides the potential to go beyond narrow parochial ethnic identities because it has an experience of uh, testing this liberal principle of uh, a democratic form of uh, you know, peoplehood defined on that one. That assembly is a classic uh, example of that one. So this uh, separate administration has root in that one. We have an inherent problem of dealing with this one. Now, what my take on this one? What I consider is this. Unfortunately, uh, 
uh, this separate emissions, many people think that this violence is the, uh, is the reason for which the separate administration has been demanded is wrong. You must be hearing this quite often on TV or otherwise. Separate administration has been there. Demand for a cookie state memorandum submitted, I have to 2012. Separate administration in 2015. It's nothing new. So you don't think that this violence has met them to demand separate administration. That's a misleading propagandist idea. So my idea is that when I analyze what has happened in the last three months, and I dare to say this, and I'm saying this, uh, in, uh, in, uh, no, it must be the second time. For this separate administration, violence has been deployed up front this time. It has never deployed before. And my principal analogy that I draw is this. When the Muslim League demanded a separate homeland for the Muslims, they have called the 16th of August 1946 as the direct action day. That's the day when the violence started in Kolkata. And it spread all the way to the Western Front in Ashish Nandi, with whom I had the fortune of uh, uh, having worked together for almost 10 years. And he put it very nicely. Partition violence started as a riot in Kolkata and it ended as a genocide in Punjab. So that violence, direct action day, I think, in my assessment, the 3rd of May is the direct action day for a separate administrations for the Kuki, Mar, Joe, this dismobilized identity. And that's what I see. And if you look, look at it, when the violence started in the border areas, I'm, it's very unfortunate that many of the images that come in this propaganda war, information war, they're saying that that's Maitai with the AK-47 was working. You can send it to any forensic lab. How the violence started in the afternoon in the Torbung areas, destroying Maitai shops and homes, recorded by the perpetrator themselves, which leaked out, and some shot by the victims. It started in the afternoon. And the violence was already started with burning down of forest offices. These are all recorded now, 29, 28, on the 3rd, during the rally itself. And if you look at Indian Express News, the headline says, rally against ST demand turns violent. And it says, it started in the border between Churachampur and Vishnupur district, one. And two, it said, Times of Indian Express says, houses of belonging to a particular community was burned down. It was Maitai's houses. Because in the same news it says that tribal houses were burned in the evening in Imphal. If they can identify tribal in the next paragraph, why can't they identify? If it is the same tribal houses, they would have also said it, tribal houses were burned in Vishnupur. Why is that that report only said? So consistently then you will see that who started the violence becomes part of the narrative. As if it is Maitai's who have started it. Now mark my word here, this should not be taken as a justification for the violence in Imphal. I'm very clear about this one. But do not tell a wrong narrative trying to paint Maitai's as the one who started it. It's equally unethical and it is wrong. And if you have listened to my first public statement in print, in print media in my, uh, on video, I said, why did you allow this violence reactions to happen in Imphal like this? The state should have reigned in this violence. And I have been calling out consistently that the state has failed to do this. But to paint Maitais as a demonized community they started is absolutely wrong. Those AK-47 holding guys who have been destroying houses and burned belongs to the Kuki Jau communities. Send these videos to forensic lab. Some people started saying that this is a mob video. It's a war, propaganda war. And I'm saying that it needs to be owned up. How this violence started and why? Now, one must understand this goes back 
to my second point, what did the failure of the state? Here again, the narrative is, the state failure is that Maite is colluding with this state and persecuting cookies has been the net. I have been saying that the state has failed. And the propaganda is such that Karan Thapa says that the Indian state is colluding with the Maite is an attacking cookie when he interviewed uh, Niketu Iralu. Using paramilitary forces against the cookies. And all along, before that interview, Maitais have been complaining about the Assam rifles because it is Assam rifles which enables this cookie to come and burn our houses and so and so forth. Am I making sense? Yes. Maitais have been complaining against Assam rifles from the day one. And the national media says Assam rifle is used by the Maitais to attack cookies. Indian state is colluding with the Maitais. And Maitais are Complaining against the army, uh, especially paramilitary forces, the Assam Rifles. So I said, Indian state not stopping this violence, Indian state is involved in the violence. But how it is the propaganda has been carried out? Indian state is colluding with, Maita is to attack cookies. And you can have video samples now coming up, one by one, one by one. But then I realized one thing. In Indian federal setup, it is very easy to blame the powerless. So money police become a scapegoat. Nobody is going to defend. But you accuse the Indian Army in Assam Rifles, the defense ministry defends. Even when the police file an FIR against with a video recording of how they stop them. Because it is a national forces. Manipur police? Nobody. And again, there's only one side of Manipur police. You know what? Maite is also blame Manipur police. How? Because the top officials were cookie officers. And they have withdrawn the commando from these areas where the violence happened a day before or two days before. Because they get access to the file. Everybody knows. How did this cookie group get access to the itinerary of the home minister? Just as he landed in Imphal, it was up on the website. How is that the cookie get access to the army officers' names and the officers' name and their deployment areas? Had it happened, I have said this on national TV. Had it happened in the other part in Kashmir, there would have been a hangama in this country. Defense expert would raise this question. How did such kind of information was allowed to be leaked? And I can tell you that I have talked to retired generals and so on. They said they are investigating. And some of them point fingers at the joint command sectors. But the point is, Maiti didn't get access to that one. Why? So when you said state is colluding, you have to be a little more nuanced. My assessment is this. Any violence, Gujarat violence, Muzaffarnagar violence, Delhi violence against the Sikh, all of them were put under control within a few days. Why is that this violence been allowed for so long? Why? We need to ask this kind of questions. And your one-sided narrative of Maitai police, and this doesn't work. There are cookies, there are Nagas, and there are Pangals, there are Maitais in that police force. You have completely destroyed an institution called police. Once you destroy an institution like this, can you think about a life without the police forces? Can we think without the police? And I've been saying this, similarly, Indian armies and paramilitary, the sanctity of these institutions must also be protected. I've said this on National TV, the day the army's own sanctity has been destroyed, there's nothing to save in this country. One must understand this, but I'm very disappointed with the defense ministry. Instead of addressing this mistrust deficit, they started flexing muscles. Yes, humanity is not our weakness and so on. But they must come up upfront. Why did you... Uh, 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 have you they answered anything about these leakages? No. So who's colluding with whom? Can you see the frustration among the Maitai Maira Pipes? Why did they stop these armies? Why is that the first few days itself, give us gun, we don't need cloth. Why is that that voice comes from the Maitais? 
Put these dots in places and you will understand. Instead of communalizing and blame game, the failure of the state is the most terrible story of this event for me. Because we have gone back to the Hobbesian world. Everybody is defending by themselves. When you arm these civilians to defend themselves, it's what in political science you call it Hobbesian war. Everybody is against everybody else. War against all. It's a failure of the state. It's not your normal minority, majority, tribal, non tribe Everybody is armed now. And I talked to a serving officer, he says, it will take at least a core strength to control this, to suck up around about 1,500 guns floating in the society. Has this been effort? You must be asking this instead of talking about tribal, non-tribal, cookie and maitai, because you don't have a civilized, normal, peaceful order now. Do I make sense this one? This kind of question should have been asked by the rest of the country as well, rather than taking position and partition. In a state like India, with the, one of the largest and powerful armed forces, how did this happen? It never happened in this history of this country. When the civilians are armed to the teeth, and blame game has been going on, you know, looting arms from this, we only looted one police station, you looted this, that's not the issue. The issue is, if I ask, this is what any defense officers will ask. Forget Imphal, Imphal you'd say blame it on police looting. How is that the hills are firing guns for three months? You ask any serving army officers, listen to them what they say. This gun is not the problem. This ammunition is To fire for the money, say truck lots of bullets are required. Where is it? And presenting in the show for the television, you know, this is a village guard. This is a, you are showing it off. But there are videos where you have some of the most sophisticated arms, which is even not in the hands of the Indian army. How this has been happening? That's why any civilian and any civilized sensible person must be going beyond this communal narrative and try to see that how this has been allowed like this in a country like India. People are killing each other. And people are killing not for what they did. Because he is a cookie, that's why you're killing him. You kill another because he is a mighty. Did he do something? No. That's what Kofi Annan once referred genocidal violence. You kill somebody not for what he does, but because he belongs to a certain identity. That's genocidal violence. Why is that Indian state is saying that like, we can't do anything? Is it allowed? Sometimes contradictory statement, this is a communal right, sometimes no, it's not a communal right. So I think this is, so when I say state failure, I have said this on television program as well. You know, when you pick and choose, when you only blame the state government and Biden and so on, you are trying to is to trap yourself in communal because you think Biden is might in hands. But see the videos. Biden's effigies has been burned by the Maitais in protest. How do you equate Biden with Maitais? How do you equate the entire Maitai with Maitai Lipun? Are the armed groups like these uh, uh, political armed groups? No, they are not. Is this like the Sioux group, which is actually an armed organization in talk with the Indian government? Day in, day out, Maitai Lipun, Maitai Lipun. Organization like this. How do they represent the Maitais? How is it Maitai Lipun is equal to Maitais? Is it so? Biren is equal to Maitais? The fact that there are MLAs from Maitais who didn't like this chief minister also. There are Maitais protesters burning effigies of this one. So when I say, when you attack Biren and others, this is part of a communal narrative. That's why I'm objecting to it. And I'm the one who has called that Manipur government is nothing but it is a proxy government. I've said it's on national TV. It's a rubber stamp. So the, because attacking Biren is because it is associated with Mites, it serves a particular communal narrative. If you're genuinely concerned about the violence to end people, then you won't be doing this. You'll be asking, how can we lend it up this? Now you're displaying the army like marching on the Independence Day in Turan Champur. You're watching it. This is militarization of the mindset, militarization of the, of the society, civil spaces, and so on. Do you want to live like this? 
Fundamentally, that's what democracy is. Remember that the saying, when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, it was the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. That's why across the globe, militaristic thinking and military is always kept out of the civilian spaces. Who is the commander in chief of Indian Army? Armed forces in this country. President, he's a civilian. That's the logic every across the world. In America, what, they, they will not allow army to speak about politics like this. That has been the culture. So militaristic militarization is the mindset. You see the people doing this commando style uh, dressing up. You're flexing muscle. You think it will go on like this? Is that the kind of society that you want? That's a fundamental question that you will be asking in this. So for me, what I'm saying is, when I say state failure, remember that the major narrative has been a communalized narrative. You're not looking at the fundamental basic question of the state failure and so on. And the third one, unlike the communal riots, Manipur has been a theater of armed insurgencies for decades, for 50, 60 years. That's why it complicates the picture. If you look some of these MLAs, Imanga Kuki MLAs, check it. This lady who won from Kampopi, her husband is the president of another rebel group who is in talk with the government of India. The nexus between the mainstream politics and the armed incidents is well known in Manipur. Whether it's the Bimaites or the Naga groups or the Kukis, that complicates the story. Have you ever heard about this? No. Maitai, Kuki, Maitai, Kuki, tribal, non-tribal, minority, majority. You don't even understand what complication it creates. Now what I, I, I wanted to share with you is this. This nexus, you can see many of these uh, Kuki MLAs and others, how they are tied up with another rebel groups in the uh, Sioux talks. Check that one. And you will see this how this nexus between the mainstream politics and the uh, insurgents, this legacy has been there. You can check some of these things and that's why you complicate. Now, this is where the separate administration is not merely an expression of the desire of a need of a particular community for certain demand. It has complicated. And when I say the 3rd of May, is a direct action day. There is another dimension to this when you ask about the Indian state's role. There is a larger strategic aim that one can suspect that the Indian state is looking out of this. Have you ever heard when the Muslims and Hindus fight in this country or the Sikhs and Hindu fight? Did you ever talk about, you know, like in Charminar area in Hyderabad, you keep all the Muslim there? and create a buffer zone between the Hindus and have you ever heard about that? In Mumbai you have done that riots. Have you ever done this one? In, in Delhi when you have another riot, anywhere in this country, have you ever talked about shifting one community into another ghetto and then you have a cricket, a create a buffer zone and so on? What is this government of India doing? Buffer zone is a terminology that is to be used among foreign countries and yourself. It's not among your own civilians. Is it because that Manipur is not the mainstream India? So you're de dealing it like a foreign country, as if Indian armed forces are involving in the conflict between the outsiders and they're trying to resolve and creating a buffer zones. Incidentally, the same lady, uh, Mary Grace, first time she used the word buffer. After a week or so, Indian armies started using that vocabulary. So I asked, why is the same vocabulary between the Indian Army and the, this cookie lady? Why is that the Indian Army's uh, leak information to these people? What's going on? It's a legitimate question to be asked. It is for the defense ministries and others to come clean on this. Because as I told you, the sanctity of the Indian Armed Forces must be maintained. And they can resolve these issues if they want to. Don't create buffer zones and ghetto-wise enclaves of communities. That is not done in India. What does it mean that we will not live together with the Maitre? Supposing if I join army or I am a professor, do you think that in that university, none of the cookie students will come and join as students? 
If the Maitis are serving in an Indian army, do you mean that the cookies will not work with an army officers? What is called corporate ideologies of an Indian army, you follow command not because he's a Brahmin or a Kayas or a Dalit or a you know, Madrasi or a Punjabi or a Manipuri. You follow command because he's your commanding officer. That's the ethos of the Indian army. You're saying, you no, know, remove this mighty officer from that unit. What is this vocabulary? What do you mean by that? You are an Indian citizen. You are going to live together. What do you mean by that we can't live together? You are in a hospital. Are you not going to consult a Maitai doctor? Or you will not join that hospital because there is a Maitai or a Kuki doctor there? That's the ridiculous nature of this idea. So I am saying that these aspirations of the people, the sense of grievances of lack of developments or certain concern about the identities issues is not being addressed. There's a twisted, unacceptable form of discourse has dominated it. Rather than asking about the failure of the state to have a democratic and civilized peaceful order, you're creating a wartime machine like this civil war, and you're creating buffer zones and so on, and ghettoized community enclaves. That's a logic that you cannot. This country has suffered partition, ghettoizations of people, and you're following the same thing here. So these are some of the questions that we ought to ask as we started thinking about you know, uh, future. So what is the way forward? I just wanted to give some of these things before I end up. So far what I've said is the discourse has been communalized. I've already defined what communalism according to Vipan Chandra and I saw. I've already said about the history of this place. What is this hill valley? What is tribal, non-tribal? You see, it is like if you see the map of Manipur and from the Google map, it is like the valley and hills are like flesh and blood vessels. It's embedded. You can't tear it. In fact, the closer you are, so organically connected geography that Manipur is. In fact, entire Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, one thing you should also note. That is geographical, organic nature of the state of Manipur is also seen. Any student of geography will know this. All the rivers that flows in Nagalands is from the southeast to the northwest. In Mizoram, the same thing follows. From the southeast to the northwest. Manipur, all the major river flows from north to south or northwest to southeast. And the mountain ranges in both Nagaland and Mizoram, the eastern side is higher than the western side. In Manipur, the eastern uh, ranges are slightly lower than the western ranges. So there is an organicity about this relationship. And valley, by definition, is part of a mountainous region. You have always seen it. And there you are talking about hill and valley. This is what the Britishers have introduced. And government of India continues with Manipur Land Reform and Revenue Act and so on. And I've already told you about minorities in 40.33 tribal versus Maitai population of barely around 43, 45%. It's not the same as 14% Muslim and 80% Hindu Muslim minority and so on. And these Maitais were boxed in, in less than 10% of the land. I have told you about bureaucracy. Anybody can check these things. So a lot of false information, false narrative has been going on. Rather than asking accurate and objective questions for the well-being of the people, both the country and, and in Manipur, unfortunately, we have this disinformation, communal lens has become the mainstream to talk about it. At the end of the day, I have been saying this, whether you are a separate administration or not, you're bound to encounter as citizens here. And if you don't know the historicity of the state of Manipur, how the Maitais feel about this place, I can tell you not only today, anything you take a wrong move, it will be a thousand years war. Sometimes manifest in physical confrontation or otherwise. Either you look for a future where you don't have this estrangement or you look for that continuous conflictual relationship. That's the choice that we have in front of us today. So what is the next move that we need to do? Now, for long, there has been this, what in political science we call it, politics of redistribution. 
There has been this feeling that the Maitais have been the dominant, they have uh, usurped the wealth and goods and services of the state, Hill is deprived and so on. This narrative, to my mind, is not fully true. Because you need to look, any graduate students of economics will know, when you have economic development discourses, there are topographical factors, there are a lot of literature how geography shapes economic planning. Today we have planning commission, we have even recognizing this aspect, topographically sensitive planning, this is part of Niti Aayog today. If geography and topography has nothing to do with development, then the planning commission Niti Aayog would not have done this topography specific development project. It's well known all over the world that there is a need to look into the role of topography and geographical factors. All the 90% of these uplands in Manipur is sparsely populated. So that brings in the second aspect, the demographic factors. What are the demographic factors? Look at Prime Minister's Yozna. In the hill areas and tribal areas, if a village doesn't have more than uh, uh, at least 250 population, you can't take that Yozna to build roads. Now, do you think a village, especially among the Kuki villages, which barely have 100 people or 150 people, do you think you can have that Prime Minister's Yozna to build roads? So there are geographical factors, there are demographic factors in planning. Third aspects. Do you think that when the low-end order is so bad, people will come and invest? Any graduate student of economics will answer, no. You need peace and order for people to come to capital, to move and investment to come in. What has been Manipur for the last 50 years? It was in the theater of armed conflict. And the valley area is easier to handle in some sense. In the lowland, it's not difficult. But in the upland areas, rugged mountain ranges and so on, that's why Indian Army was called it. It has been the theater of armed conflict, ambush and killings, extraction by these armed groups, and all of them has been going on. What do you think that it has no whatsoever role to play in the development issues in Manipur? Please tell me. Is law and order a factor in economic development? Last but not the less, among the sociologists and economists, you know something called, is taken from Weber, called neo patrimonial structure. Where this private and public distinction is not maintained, every ruler who get access to the wealth and power of the state usurp it is for personal front. They think it's personal property. It's the elite who get access to the structure of the state, they share this point. And today's conflict, mind you, is also emanated from the conflict among politicians as well. Please keep in mind us. This government doesn't have a single minister from Churachampur area. For the first time. God knows why. In the cabinet, there is not a single one from Churachampur area. You do, no balancing act. Remember, even the Indian cabinet, you do that, you know, from Bihar, Silega, yeah, South Silega, your yeah, cabinet. Eh? There are conflict. You can check, you read between the lines. There are personalized discourse in their interviews of this politician on national TV. So there are political elites angle to that one. So new patrimonial structures. What I am saying is this. This Tendency to Imphal, if you emit it, Imphal, it is in the lowland, it's a flat land, and it's a capital all over the country, all over the world, you know that the urbanization, how it drags in people and attracts, and it's easier to invest, it's a capital city. You can't compete district headquarters with the capital city, and it houses 36% of the entire population. Out of 16 districts, in only one area, you have this 36% of the population. Now, does it justify this policy? No. You can't have these urban-centric areas. You must disperse. But to communalize these development issues as Maite is absorbing it, as if Maite's are enjoying this economy. The poorest section, BPL, how many percentages? Are you aware of this? Among the Maite's. Nobody cares. Simply because they are Maite's that you will not bother? 
because they are not scheduled time. You must have a non-communalized discourse on development issues. That's what I'm saying. It way forward because there is a genuine or otherwise perceived or real sense of discrimination and the lack of development in the areas where the new tribe lives. So there must be look into it. We must look into these issues. Incidentally, I have lobbied with two CMs, one in 2012. I said, please institute something like a such a committee to look into two dimension, I say. What is the social economic status of all the communities in this state? Which of these tribes have how many graduates, postgraduate, how many doctors, how many officials in the bureaucracy? Please check it. And second, if there is any differential development in Manipur, please check it. What are the factors responsible for it and can take corrective measures? I love it with the CM of Manipur. He announced it in December 2012. Roughly around four days after I met him. But they did not follow it up. Similarly, one of the tribal cabinet ministers, I don't know, I was told, I don't know if it's fact or not. One of the retired bureaucrats told me, said it, why should you do that when some people complain and we'll start forming committees? They didn't do it. And this present CM, when he became the first time CM, I lobbied with him again. I said, there is a grievance among certain section of the population about development issues. Please start with a high level committee like this. Look at otherwise this is going to be used up in a communal discourse that creates violence and tension and relationship problem. He did not follow it up. And I openly told him this in public function as well. Check it. My conversation with the same on 18 October 2018 is available on YouTube. I asked him. This divide between Indian value on development issues, why you don't do something like this? So if the politician bought from the hill or the value, the tribal and non-tribal, whichever term you call it, if you're genuinely interested in addressing development discourses, please do an objective assessment rather than blaming Maitais or this. Maitai also started blaming the elites of the hill. I said, that's not a discourse. Let's check what is the role of topography, what is the role of demography, what is the role of the planning schemes, the different projects, and the manner in which it is implemented, what are the lacunas, what are the you know, shortcomings. Please take it, open it to the public once. You know why I demanded this committee? Like the searcher, if it has come out in public, then less of us also get a chance to look at the data, sahi hai ya galat hai, kya sahi hai, kya galat hai. So everybody partake in a democracy. Chance nahi mila, ulta kya chal raha hai. Sometimes I get so unnerved, you know, with due respect. I know that people have a grievances. Sometimes I say, lane slide who are in hill areas. You will form a committee to look at the hidden hand of Maitais in that lane slide. Can you work on that level of suspicion? No, you cannot. So the way forward must be an objective measure to address these grievances of the hill. Uh, or they said we'll try populations. There's no second opinion on this thing. One must have this one. Rather than communalizing the discourse and looking through the lens of their objective assessment that can be done. Now, second, about this autonomy and others, you know, if you look at the literature, many of the six schedules are the site of corruption is reported by CAG report. There's no accountability in that thing. So you need to let a critical look. If you really want to develop yourself, then you must think about uh, institutional mechanisms where you can bring in accountability. And this identity-based politics will be harmful at one level. So today, for example, see you started something like this. Kuki, Mizo, Chin, Mar. There's a four terms, hyphen, hyphen. Then it reduced to Kuki, Chin, Mar. Then after some time, Kuki, Chin, then Kuki, Zo. Now they have stabilized in the last two, three weeks. Kuki, Zo. Check it. This is like all social science students, our newspaper, how this terminology changes within these three months. And within the same article written by these professors in the newspapers. Check it. What does it mean? Identity is not given. You remember this Brubaker's famous saying, ethnicity ki bare mein usne bola. 
identity, ethnicity is not in the world. It is a perspective on the world. It's not out there. It's a way of looking at things. And you mobilize these identities. So if you mobilize today, do you think that within this community, you will not another create a majoritarian community? Take, for example, Thado is around about 2 lakhs population. Compare with another tribal group, which is barely 20,000 or 10,000, 15,000. Do you think that they will not have another issue down the line? So some people have already uh, disclosed this one. This kind of an ethnic exclusivist agenda is not the rare basis. You must recognize this identity, but there must be a parameters to go beyond them to see a common good. And institutional mechanism should be evolved to ensure this. And we need to have a dialogue on this. So my suggestion way forward is two things. These grievances of the people of the Sidhul tribe must be genuinely addressed, just as the fear and anxieties of the Maitais in general must also be addressed. And you can't resolve a conflict by fighting. Always it comes to the dialogue. And the space for dialogue must be created. And for that, this violence, unprecedented vocabularies of buffer zones and you know, ghettoized ethnic communities, any sensible people who said this is not the solution. This is not the way. My only grievance is this. Why is that the Indian state is using these vocabularies and these measures in their own home turf? Manipur is not foreign country. It's part of India. You cannot use vocabulary which you use another one. You must treat it as part of it. So this is the basic problem. So the first of all, all of you, my request to is, please slow down your hatred for the others. Look within yourself and start looking at objectively. You can't fight on. Even if you are separate administration, you're bound to be a citizen of the same country, in the institution, in academic, in business houses, in military and armed forces. It's a ridiculous idea to cut off relationships. Some are saying that you cut off your relationship with them. I have my dear colleagues, friends and students, and I saw the other day in the market, a very cute two little, uh, little girl, two years old girl, and her father is a colleague of mine, not as a teacher, but as a, a staff in the administration. I told him, he said, Tamo, let me take a picture. I said, don't put it up, people will blame you. <laughs> he was taking it, I was, the, the girl is so cute, I said. And incidentally, my youngest daughter has her best friend, cookie girl, Moi. They talk over the phone, and they will not come for the birthday party. So keep it, my daughter started asking questions, I said, yes. But I'm saying that there are genuine grievances, there are ways to deal with it, so slow down your disinformation campaign and I expect the academic community to be a little more objective and do not be the feature of hatred and disinformation is my request to so all of you as students be human have the capacity to listen it deeply hurts my word you know it is on video now somebody has put it up before I came in public there was a consultative meeting for the Maitai only so to speak and the one girl was crying from Churachampur Maitai my tears have been completely clean from Trunchamba, by the way. And she was narrating, you know, one of the first things, which is I learned from my parent discipline. I said, you know, whatever I say to you is not going to solve your pain. I can't even claim that I understand you. But I can guess. Then I reminded her. You remember that this pain that you go through, there will be people on the other side who goes through a similar kind of thing. The day you understand that, that a human being in you and possibility of peace and empathy will come out of that. Please take it. This is advising to my own Maitai girl who cried and narrated her stories. It's on video. It has come up when somebody has used it. Because it's not to show off. That's my belief. And that's the way do you go on. You know how much as we call it chinky? I've suffered as students. But I don't have that hatred. I have taught my students from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from Gujarat to Nagaland, from Korea to Japan to Germany, people who have got PhD under my supervision. It's a lovely world, if you understand. But yes, idealism, it should also be worked through this concrete reality of our life. And so today I have taken quite a long because 
When I go to such kind of lectures, I don't only go for intellectual purpose. It is to appeal to all of you, please avoid this information campaign. And any people who are trying to generate hatred for whichever community, please counter them with care and concern. And I hopefully, uh, we shall overcome this crisis one day. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you sir.